over the course of next 15 minutes or so, I'll be talking about an evidence-based approach to discriminate intestinal tuberculosis and Crohn's disease. In India, we know that intestinal tuberculosis is very common and there is an increasing recognition of Crohn's disease. However, misdiagnosis between the two is very common. So in a study from South Korea, we can see that 18% of Crohn's disease patients were initially misdiagnosed as intestinal TB. And around 11% of intestinal TB were misdiagnosed as Crohn's disease. And this number of ITB misdiagnosed as Crohn's disease seems to be increasing. Now, the discrimination between the two can be done on the basis of certain clinical, serological, endoscopic and radiological parameters. Histology plays an important role and microbiology is usually considered a gold standard. There are also multiple multi-parameter models in use uh, which could help in providing a probability of a particular diagnosis. And eventually, if the diagnosis is uncertain, then one embarks on a response to antitubercular therapy. So coming to the clinical parameters, while pain and intestinal obstruction could occur equally frequently in either of the two conditions, a shorter duration of symptoms, presence of pulmonary lesions, fever, night sweats, and ascites suggest underlying intestinal TB, whereas presence of a predominant diarrhea with a bleeding per rectum, extra intestinal manifestations in perianal disease are more suggestive of Crohn's disease. But none of these clinical features is very specific for any of the entity. Now, coming to serological markers, there is an interest in interferon gamma release assays, which measure the release of interferon gamma when the mononuclear cells are exposed to TB antigen. This could either be measured as the concentration of interferon gamma or the cell uh, as in the T-spot test. So in a meta-analysis of five studies, the sensitivity to discriminate ITB from Crohn's disease was 74% and the specificity was 87%. There was a recent paper which talked about the levels of quantiferon and it noted that IGRA positivity was much higher in patients with TB as compared to Crohn's. And when a cutoff of more than 100 picogram per ml was used uh, to decide the, about the need for uh, ATT, it was found that those with a higher level had a very effective outcome with ATT, whereas those with lower uh, levels, the outcomes were not really as good. But this test only has an ancillary value, especially in countries like India, where underlying uh, TB infection may be very common, even in patients with Crohn's disease. And this particular test may not discriminate infection from active disease. Now, coming to anti-saccharomyces cerevisiae antibody, this test is often ordered uh, to make a diagnosis of Crohn's disease. But if you look uh, at the studies, especially those from India, the sensitivity has ranged from 30 to 60%, and at least two studies had a specificity of only 50%. And therefore, uh, we do not use this test uh, in the clinical armamentarium to make this distinction. Now, there is an interest in the T regulatory cells uh, because they can be measured in blood, and it has been found that Fox E3 positive T regulatory cells are increased in intestinal TB. In fact, a level of more than 31.35% has been shown in a couple of studies from AIMS uh, to suggest a diagnosis of intestinal TB. And this is a marker one should look forward to because it is easy to uh, do in the blood. Now, coming to uh, the endoscopic findings, we know that intestinal TB usually involves the right side of colon, uh, more the ileocecal region, and the ulcers are usually transverse. On the other hand, Crohn's disease usually involves the left side of colon. The ulcers are usually linear. There could be skip lesions, uh, and there could be a long segment involvement. So coming to the images, you can see the trans transverse ulcers in intestinal TB, the ileocecal involvement more common in, uh, in intestinal TB. You have a gaping IC with a, a cecal involvement, and then there is a distorted cecum. Again, these are findings more common in uh, intestinal TB. Ulcerated narrowing could be present in either of the conditions. Now, there could be presence of ulcers in both, but more com common in Crohn's disease. Uh, 
the linear or the, uh, the longitudinal ulcers are more frequent in Crohn's disease. The deep serpiginous ulcers are usually considered typical for Crohn's disease. And here you can see a linear ulcer more often, which is seen in uh, Crohn's disease and a circular ulcer again can occur in both, but more associated with TB. There could be pseudopolyps, again, more frequent in TB, but can occur in both of these conditions. And then there is coagulable stoning, which is usually due to deep linear ulcers and these, this, this, uh, and these mucosal eye lens, and this is more frequently noted in Crohn's disease. Now coming to radiological findings, the CT is the usual investigation which is ordered. And when one looks at the bobble wall changes, one has to interpret them in whether it's a single site of involvement or multiple sites, whether it's a right or a left colonic involvement, is it a long segment involvement, and what is the enhancement pattern? So here you can see that the right colon is involved and it's an asymmetric thickening. Here you can see mural stratification that the layers of the bowel can be seen to be separated. And this is more frequent, although can occur in both, but more frequent uh, in Crohn's disease. And there are mucosal enhancement patterns which have been described. So homogeneous pattern, more likely in TB, but a stratification with either a simple mucosal enhancement or an intervening fat layer are more frequently associated with Crohn's disease. Now the classical comb sign, you can see a thickened bobble loop and then the encorged vessa recti, which suggests mesenteric inflammation. And this is again, more frequent in Crohn's disease. You could also have uh, fibro fatty proliferation and fat wrapping of the involved part of the bowel. And then there could be skip areas with in normal bowel in between. And uh, both of these are more frequent <clears throat> in Crohn's disease. The presence of necrotic lymph nodes, which are hypodense, and there may be a rim of enhancement around them is usually suggestive of underlying tuberculosis. So if we were to summarize these findings, and this is from a meta-analysis done from the AIMS group, uh, we see that the necrotic lymph nodes are very specific for intestinal TB, but the sensitivity is low. Iliosecal involvement, again, suggestive of TB, but presence of comb signs, skip lesions, fibrofatty proliferation, mural stratification, a long segment involvement, and the left-sided involvement are more suggestive of Crohn's disease. Now, coming to histology, now, histology can be useful in some cases, and granulomas are actually found in both of these conditions, but the granulomas in intestinal TB are believed to be larger. They may have associated caseating necrosis, and they are confluent. On the contrary, Crohn's disease has microgranulomas, which are more discrete and ill-formed. Also, if the, lymph, if the lymph nodes have granuloma without uh, involvement of the intestine, then it is more likely to be TB. Fibrosis can occur in both, but more frequently uh, in TB. And then the fissures are more deep and more likely to be present in Crohn's disease. Now, this was a meta-analysis uh, which uh, talked of, of the cool sensitivity and specificity of various findings for the diagnosis of intestinal TB. And we can see that the caseating granulomas, although see, seen only in one fifth of the patients, has a very high specificity. Confluent granulomas and epithelioid his, uh, histiocytes lining the ulcer base are present in around 40% of patients and have a fairly good sensitive specificity for the diagnosis of tuberculosis. Now coming to microbiology, which is a gold standard, the problem, however, is that intestinal TB is usually a possibacillary condition. And while positivity is suggestive, negative tests do not exclude intestinal TB. Stain positivity is very infrequent and a culture positivity is usually less than 50%. Antigen tests have been reported, but they suffer for, from poor sensitivity and questionable specificity. Now, this was a meta-analysis, which included around 12 studies for this particular uh, probe, IS6110, and the sensitivity was 47% to discriminate TB from Crohn's, and the specificity was 95%. Now, Coming to gene expert, which has been rolled out by the national program, the sensitivity for diagnosis in this meta-analysis, which was done by us, was 23%. It had a very good specificity. It can give quick results, but the problem is the low sensitivity as for other microbiological tests. Now, coming to multi-parameter models, a number of multi-parameter models have been proposed. 
which use clinical endoscopic or radiological and as the parameters, including uh, some of them using uh, IGRA, MONTU test, uh, and certain other models only based on radiological parameters like the one from uh, AIMS with long segment involvement and uh, the ratio between the visceral and the subcutaneous uh, fat. So all these models uh, have been tested at single centers and therefore uh, we don't really know how the performance is outside the cohort where they have been uh, you know, created. But there is one model which was created using a Bayesian uh, analysis and this included multiple parameters including clinical, endoscopic, pathologic and serology. And this is uh, a combination and you can you know, enter whatever models are available in this is an online available model. And it also takes into account the local disease prevalence, which may not be always available, but this is one of the most comprehensive models and has been tested uh, outside uh, this particular setting from which it was derived. Now coming finally to the patients where even after all the evaluation, the diagnosis is not very clear. Now these are the patients in whom usually a, th a therapeutic trial of antitubercular therapy is undertaken. This is because it is felt that uh, immunosuppression, which is given for uh, Crohn's disease, can result to adverse outcomes if the patient has underlying tuberculosis. So this was a landmark paper which compared clinical responses and endoscopic responses to, en to antitubercular therapy in patients where there was a diagnostic confusion. So you can see that a substantive number of patients, around a third of them, who actually have Crohn's disease have a clinical response to ATT. And uh, all the pa virtually all the patients have a clinical response at six months to ATT in the TB group. Now coming to endoscopic responses, these are specific. The ulcer healing is specific for tuberculosis and therefore this can be used as a marker of uh, whether the underlying disease was TB or it was Crohn's. And this was done at six months of therapy. But it has now been shown, and these are two papers from AIMS and AIG, which show that a prolonged uh, therapy or um, antitubercular therapy in Crohn's disease can actually result in progression from inflammatory to stricturing phenotype. It also results in a lower probability of a surgery-free survival, and it contributes to diagnostic delay. Therefore, uh, it makes sense to recognize early in the course whether the underlying disease is TB or Crohn's disease. And therefore, what we did was we started doing colonoscopies at two months, and we found that the ulcer healing can actually be seen at two months. And therefore, we suggested that early mucosal response could be a good marker to determine early uh, whether the patient has underlying TB or Crohn's. So you start the ATT, do a colonoscopy at two months. If there is no healing, no early mucosal response, most of them have either Crohn's disease or a drug-resistant TB. Now we also, because some of the patients uh, do not really agree for a repeat colonoscopy, so there is an importance in looking at biomarker response. And we see that when we compare fecal calprotectin and we compare CRP, we see that the fecal calprotectin, the decline is more consistent with ATT in TB group, whereas the, the levels remain almost the same in the Crohn's disease group. On the, con uh, uh, the CRP also declines fairly well in the TB group. And while there is a decline in the Crohn's disease group also, it is less apparent than the TB group, and it is a slower decline. So the strategy which we use at our center is that whenever there's a diagnostic confusion, we start ATT, and this is after all assessment has been done. We assess objective response, ideally with a colonoscopy at two months, but if that is not possible, we do both fecal calprotectin and CRP. This comes with a caveat that some of the patient at baseline may have a normal CRP, and an occasional patient may also have a normal uh, fecal calprotectin, even in presence of a mucosal disease. So if there is no response or the ulcers are still persisting, then we need to reassess the diagnosis. So till now, people have been using histologic and endoscopic markers and symptomatic response and some serological markers. Currently, the standard is mucosal response and microbiological positivity. 
but in future we should look forward to non-invasive assessment of mucosal response imaging especially there's a study uh, from aims on diffusion weighted mri the proportion of t regulatory cells in the blood proteomic based approaches which uh, have been tested but really haven't uh, uh, been found to be very very helpful and then there are some uh, some papers uh, on artificial intelligence so to conclude intestinal and tb uh, intestinal tb and crohn's disease are diseases which are very similar to each other and there are risks involved with either starting immunosuppression or att ideally if one should have a microbiological diagnosis if that is not possible or the diagnosis is not clear a att trial is warranted in indian setting and then one should look for early mucosal response and possibly biomarkers on follow up thank you for your kind attention